Welcome, and thank you for joining Men's Health Emerging Market Healthcare Innovation Trends from the Trenches is a webinar series that we've been running for the last eight months. It's a pleasure to have with us today, Dr. Charles Maudlin. Dr. Maudlin is a kidney transplant specialist. He's a surgeon. He's one of 20 African-American kidney transplant surgeons in the United States. He's also founder and director of the Minority Men's Health Center at Cleveland Clinic's Glickman Urological and Kidney Institute. I'm Andrea Simon. I'm a corporate anthropologist and president of Simon Associates Management Consultants. We specialize in helping organizations change. And I've spent about a dozen years working with healthcare institutions, both internally as a leader in marketing and branding, as well as working with clients today and helping them deal with the changing healthcare environment. Dr. Maudlin is going to talk to us today about how he has, for the past dozen years, successfully been engaging men in their health and wellness through very strategically targeted programs at the Cleveland Clinic. The annual men's health fair draws thousands of men in annually. We just had the latest in April. The Minority Men's Health Center is a beautiful facility dedicated to men's health, particularly focused on minority men's health, but on men's health. And he has many outreach programs. I particularly like the way in which he goes out into the field where there are barbershops and beauty salons to reach people where they are. Particularly important is that the increased engagement, and he'll discuss this with you later, in health and wellness has actually resulted in a significant improvement in health outcomes that men have been experiencing as a result of his efforts. The webinar series came about because many of us were beginning to see trends in the trenches. Healthcare is going through a major transformation. Could we see things that could help others jumpstart their own transformation or get insights faster than they might otherwise. What was really happening? Could we help share it? So whether it was Chris Barlow talking about physician services or Diane Auger about branding and rebranding, Linda McCracken looking at the big data and what it was helping us see, Margie Davino who did a marvelous story about all she's saying from a legal and regulatory perspective, Ben Dillon, who is an e-health evangelist and has some new research on what's happening in mobile and tablets and e-health. And I did one on innovation and how we do it, what's the back end. Next month, Sam Basta will be talking about how you implement innovative change. Why healthcare innovation trends from the trenches. As an anthropologist, we're trained to help see, feel, and think in new ways by observing, by hanging out, not by actually asking people what they're doing or why, although culture probes are part of our toolkit, often people don't know what they're doing or why. And all of a sudden, when you begin to see them doing things, all sorts of new things emerge. This came actually from a client of ours. The real world of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And that indeed is what we're all about and what this webinar series is about. So let me talk to you a little bit about how I got involved with Dr. Maudlin and why his talk is so timely and important. I was working as the interim senior vice president at Hurley Medical Center in Flint, Michigan. And Hurley was a wonderful safety net hospital, but we're blue ocean strategists. So we began to look for unmet needs among non-users. Hurley has three competitive hospitals. They all have about 20,000 discharges. The Genesee County is in a growth market. As a safety net hospital, it knew that half of its income streams were from Medicaid and uninsured, and 45% of Flint is African-American. Hurley Medical Center in the 1960s was one of four hospitals in the country that trained African-Americans to become doctors. It has a very deep and dear affection for and commitment to the African-American community. It was, however, focused on women, moms, and children. One of the folks who worked with us was an African-American gentleman. This is not his picture, but it could be. And he was beginning to work in the market to see who had unmet needs. Where could there be growth opportunities? And he had this aha moment. I always think these come as epiphanies, aha moments when all of a sudden he realized that his father, who was a General Motors retiree with health insurance, was beginning to have failing health. But he had no physician, no idea how to deal with a doctor, and didn't go to doctors. We began to dig further. The Men's Health Network in Washington provided us with lots of insights. 
And what we found was that only 62% of men have primary care doctors. Boy, is that a market waiting for somebody to focus on them. 92% of women have a primary care doctor or a gynecologist. Men typically don't have urologists or a general doctor. What more interesting than that was that the American Association of Family Practice Physicians in 2007 had seen that just about half of all men had not seen their primary care physician for a physical exam within the past year. And the doctors who we spent time hanging out with said, huh, when he deals with a man, he speaks with an imposter. And the doctor was very cute. He said, I know I have to change my practice habits to engage men more completely. He said those words. He said, the problem is that the practice is designed around women and men don't feel comfortable when they come to see me. Here was the opportunity. Could we engage and transform them, improve access, increase awareness, advocate, make health a higher personal priority, open a blue ocean of unmet needs among non-users? And that's exactly what Dr. Maudlin has done at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Maudlin is a nationally renowned specialist in the world that he's dealing with here. Let me turn this over to Dr. Maudlin and let him share with you what he and the Cleveland Clinic are doing and have done so well. I have a slide up now that really gives us a working definition of what healthcare disparities is. I think it's important that we have a working definition throughout the, the presentation. And basically, healthcare disparities really refers to population-specific differences in the presence of disease, health outcomes, or access to healthcare. So that's what we really mean when we talk about healthcare disparities. I mentioned the Minority Men's Health Center. It's located at the main campus of Cleveland Clinic. We see patients three times a week in this building. It's called the Glickman Tower. We invite any of your listening audience to come and, and tour the center and see what we're doing. So we're actually seeing patients throughout the year in addition to our annual Minority Men's Health Fair. A little bit about the Minority Men's Health Center before we get more into the specific examples of healthcare disparities. We actually are housed within urology, but we partner and collaborate with all aspects of Cleveland Clinic. So when we see patients uh, in the Minority Men's Health Center, I see patients as a urologist. I have even more than one internal medicine physician. We have hospital chaplains, social workers, pharmacy, uh, uh, prescription assistants, technicians, nurses, medical assistants. We have a full complement of people that are actually ready and, and willing to see patients. And it's important that we talk about culturally sensitive delivery of patient care. And we're going to get more into that as, as we move along. So we're talking about special health concerns specifically seen in minority males. Our first target population, we, we focused in on African-American males, but we are expanding that to other minority populations. And I, I have to say also that anybody can come to the Minority Men's Health Center regardless of race or ethnicity. So even our, our health fair, we don't limit who can come to that, but we have a special outreach to these healthcare disparity populations. When we talk about minorities, just a working definition, and it's important to note that the percentage of what we consider to be minorities is actually growing in the United States. Back in 1970, you can see on the slide, about 12% of the population was considered to be minority. And by 2050, the minorities will actually become the majority population. So we're referring to African-Americans, Hispanic, Latinos, Asian-Americans, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders when we talk about minorities and uh, healthcare disparities. Again, this is just a very busy slide showing the uh, percentage population from the 2000 census and 2010 census. The African-American populace has actually roughly stayed about the same, about 12%. The white American population has gone from about 75% in 2000 to about 63%. But actually, you can see the Hispanic Latino population has grown from 12.5% to about 16.3%. So, so the, there are demographics that are changing. And so it is important because some people sometimes say, well, you know, why are you so focused on a, a minority percentage of the population? Well, that minority percentage of the population is going to become the majority percentage of the population. And if that percentage of the population suffers disproportionately, and is afflicted with the variety of conditions and, and diseases that result in decreased uh, longevity, that's going to have overall implications in terms of the overall health and wellness of the nation, which translates into, into the overall productivity 
of the nation as well. So we have to focus our efforts as a society on the elimination of health care disparities. I also acknowledge, and anthropologists can confirm this, we don't really know what constitutes the definition of race, but especially I think that it is important, whatever you know definition you use, I think it is important to use the race in biomedicine in terms of race can be utilized as a surrogate marker for detecting the likelihood that certain medical conditions or diseases may be more prevalent or prone to occur in populations or even in given individuals. And so, for example, we know that sickle cell anemia is more likely to occur in African Americans. We know that hypertension is more likely to occur in African Americans. And so when we as healthcare providers, for instance, would have an African American patient before us and we're trying to treat them for hypertension and we see that our treatment <clears throat> regimen is not as effective as we would like, we might want to take into consideration the fact that this is an African American patient and they may respond differentially to different agents used to treat hypertension and I can talk more about that later. But again, I, and I have down here, we have to avoid the risk or danger of stereotyping or discriminating individuals on the basis of race. So you have to do it ethically and use it within the right context when you're talking about consideration of race in biomedicine. So I'm going to get into some examples of healthcare disparities that we <clears throat> see in African Americans and also many of which are, are more prevalent even in African American male populations. So compared to the general population, 44% more African Americans die from cancer each year, 30% higher incidence of death rate attributable to heart disease, 180% greater incidence of death from stroke seen in African American populations. And again, this is just a diagram depicting the incidence of high blood pressure levels according to race or ethnicity and according also to gender. So the overall percentage of the population that is afflicted with hypertension, high blood pressure is about anywhere between 30 to 35 percent. Whites, again, you can see suffer less, lower rates of hypertension compared to African Americans, which are about 40, close to 45 percent. And year in, year out, when we survey the men and take their blood pressures at the health fair, we have incidence rate of high blood pressure, elevated blood pressure in our health fair attendees, uh, roughly of about 45 percent. So uh, what we're seeing is in keeping with, with national statistics as well. So again, and your listening audience, I'm sure, is already aware of this. Hypertension is a risk factor for other comorbidities, uh, kidney, heart, vascular uh, disease that can lead to heart attacks, strokes. Some of the um, predisposing factors are uh, urban living, poverty, high salt diets, the type of uh, food selection. But also it's believed that uh, African Americans may uh, be genetically predisposed to developing hypertension. And there's a, I'm going to throw it out there, I don't really have time to go into it, there's, there's a middle passage theory um, that basically states that one reason that, that African Americans may be predisposed to developing hypertension is because we are the descendants of the slaves that actually were able to survive the Middle Passage three or four months on the slave ships coming from Africa to the New World. And consequently, were those individuals the genetic descendants that were able to retain more so salt and water in our bodies, which allowed us to, to survive that Middle Passage. But actually, that could even be a discussion of a future webinar in and of itself. So the next slide I'm going to go to, the greater incidence of diabetes in African Americans, 80% higher incidence of diabetes in African Americans. And all these health care disparities combined contribute to the fact that African Americans have a seven to eight year shorter life expectancy from birth compared to white Americans. And there's a lot of misconception out there. People oftentimes think that these health care disparities only afflict lower socioeconomic individuals, minorities, but that's not true. Even affluent African Americans are known to have higher rates of many of these conditions which I've spoke of and consequently suffer from, from health care disparities and lower long-term life expectancies. So it affects all populations regardless of socioeconomic status. Again, these are just some charts uh, showing the life expectancy from 1975 onward up to 2005. And again, even though in this country, the United States, our life expectancy is trending upwards, you can, all, you can see on these graphs 
there is a consistent six to close to seven and a half, eight, eight and a half year differential in life expectancy. Actually, when you look at the males, uh, it goes from about seven years to about eight and a half year uh, differential life expectancy in females. It's about six years to about four and a half years. So from 1975 onward, so it, it continues to be a problem, the differential gap in life expectancy. Number of deaths per 100,000 patient population by race, greater incidence of death in blacks. I'm gonna go, go through some of these slides very quickly. Some of these conditions are what we call preventable, some are non-preventable. Death from firearms, again, that's a whole nother discussion, but we still see twice the rates of death from firearms in blacks versus whites in the United States and three times that incidence uh, in the state of Ohio. Death due to cardiovascular disease and heart failure, more so in African-Americans. I wanted to point this out, and there have been studies uh, demonstrating that when they've actually had, and this is published in JAMA, that when they have actors and actresses portraying for physicians scenarios where they would present with symptoms that would suggest the presence of cardiovascular disease, there were differences in terms of the physician decision making according to the race or ethnicity and also even the gender of the uh, patient, model patients before them. And they found out that African Americans with the same symptomatology were about 13% less likely to be referred for an angio, a coronary angiography to diagnose heart disease. And even more so were one third less likely to be referred to undergo surgical therapy for that uh, presumed heart disease. This is just the, actually it's New, New England Journal of Medicine is where it was published. This is a study that I talked about, the effect of race and sex on, on physicians' recommendations for cardiac catheterization. And that is somewhat troublesome. It, it deserves more research and study in terms of, you know, why would physicians tailor their decision making in terms of invasive or surgical revascularization for heart disease based on the race or ethnicity of the patient. So when we get more into some other healthcare disparities, heart failure, for example, and a lot of physicians, and I point this out because a lot of physicians, healthcare providers don't necessarily, or they may maybe not as aware as they, as they should be, that congestive heart failure, for example, the etiology differs according to the race of the patient. For example, 40% of African Americans develop heart failure as a result of hypertension compared to only 7% of blacks. Again, we talked about the major risk factors, but also what is important and that we see consistently, no matter what disease we're talking about, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, heart disease, African Americans in general are known and you know to have less knowledge of risk factors compared to other populations, even when taking into account their education and their age. So one thing we need to do, and I'll go more into this later, is develop more specific educational initiatives to raise the health literacy levels of given individuals. Higher rates of death from stroke, and again, I'm gonna go through just some of these slides. I just wanted to show as many examples as I could of the healthcare disparities. Higher rates of cerebral vascular disease in African Americans. And I have here in orange, I wanna point this out. <clears throat> there are different types of strokes, either hemorrhagic or ischemic. And it's known that African Americans have a higher incidence and mortality rate from strokes, but African Americans have more hem hemorrhagic compared to uh, ischemic strokes in whites. And this actually has implications uh, for healthcare providers in terms of knowing the most likely etiology may determine what type of uh, therapeutic option is selected for that given patient. So, and again, this is another example of where the etiology of disease and the treatment may differ according to the race or ethnicity of the patient. And again, this is an example of what we term race-based medicine has to be practiced very carefully so that we don't stereotype any given individual, but my main point is the fact that physicians and healthcare providers need to be aware of a lot of these differences that I speak of. We get to cancer. African Americans develop and die the four most common cancers compared to the majority population. Breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer. Number of deaths, cancer deaths per 100,000 uh, patient population, again, much higher in African Americans. And again, these slides will be available for people to review and reference later. This is data from the uh, Henry uh, J. Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, there's a lot of great information on that at that website. 
Now, why is it that African Americans or one contributing factor have higher rates of cancer? A lot of it may be related to smoking. Even though African Americans start smoking on average about three years uh, later in life, the type of cigarettes that African Americans choose are, are generally higher in nicotine intake per cigarette. And it's believed that African Americans have a difference in metabolism of some of the uh, substances that are included in the uh, tobacco. And again, there are disparities with respect to my field of practice of medicine in, in urology also. And this is a publication that we published in 2010 about racial disparities in urologic health. These are the authors here. And specifically, one of the things that we wanted to look at and why we developed the Minority Men's Health Center, and again, we developed a men's health center initially because we wanted to focus on, as urologists, disparities with respect to prostate cancer. And we see that African Americans develop and die from prostate cancer twice as often as Caucasian Americans. This is depicted by these statistics right here. One thing is that, and there's some controversy in terms of whom should be screened for prostate cancer and at what age they should start be screening for prostate cancer. So very briefly, the way in which urologists diagnose prostate cancer is through a screening with a blood test. It's called a PSA prostate specific antigen blood test, as well as a digital rectal examination. The American Urologic Association just came out with new recommendations about a year ago. And it basically pointed out that because of the higher risk of prostate cancer and the more aggressive prostate cancer that is often detected in African Americans, African Americans should start screening at the age of 40 for prostate cancer with a blood test and a digital rectal examination. Whereas individuals at lower risk for prostate cancer, namely Caucasian Americans and those without significant family history, should start screening 15 years later at age 55. So again, another stark example of how the delivery of healthcare and the, the recommendations even for screenings vary according to the race of the given individual. Some of these slides you can use for reference later on. I don't have to go exactly through every one of these slides. Again, this is the publication uh, that we wrote in the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine about disparities in prostate cancer in African Americans, specifically what primary care physicians need to know and do to screen black men for prostate cancer and uh, consequently uh, take care of, of black men with prostate cancer. And by the way, I believe as a urologist that every man, regardless of race or ethnicity, should actually have a urologist. Much like every woman has a gynecologist, in addition to having a primary care provider, I believe that every man should have a urologist. And the Minority Men's Health Center, and again, I talked about the importance of this screening for prostate cancer with this blood test called PSA. The What is considered normal, a normal PSA, also may differ according to the race of the individual. And so some of our cutoff levels in terms of when we screen men, African-American men, for prostate cancer are also age-dependent, but also differ according to some of our screening recommendations for non-African-American males. So if you're an African-American male coming to see us, if your PSA is above two and a half, we may suggest either that you get a prostate biopsy or repeat that PSA uh, because of the higher incidence of prostate cancer. And so these are just some age-related guidelines uh, that we use in the Minority Men's Health Center to screen African-American men. And we want to educate our primary care physicians who are often are the first point of health access for these individuals that there are differences in terms of the recommendation for screening according to the race of the individuals who are at higher risk for prostate cancer, namely African Americans. And so, you know, we know that, that primary care physicians do serve as a vital role, first line, in terms of not only screening, but educating men about the importance of screening. Real quick, I'm going to go through some real quick examples that we see in urology in terms of disparities, erectile dysfunction, which is a big concern of all men, but it even has a higher incidence in African-American males. Again, urologists are the doctors that address this. Kidney disease, and again, I'm a kidney transplant surgeon. Kidney disease is more prevalent, actually about four to six times more greater, or you know, greater incidence in African-Americans compared to white Americans, namely because of higher rates of diabetes and hypertension, which I mentioned before, which are the leading causes of kidney failure. And then you talk about renal transplantation, access to renal transplantation. 
disparities following renal transplantation. There's over 100,000 patients on the kidney transplant waiting list nationally to receive a, a kidney transplant. African Americans represent only about 12% of the U.S. population, yet represent actually now close closer to about 40% of those individuals in need of a kidney transplant. So that is a remarkable disparity that we see in terms of the incidence of end-stage renal disease and, and need for kidney transplantation. I wanted to spend just one minute real quick. So I, I basically outlined a lot of the healthcare disparities that we see. I mentioned that the fact that we started a dedicated initiative at Cleveland Clinic called the Minority Men's Health Center. But one of the things we've been doing for greater than a decade is trying to research and develop a clear understanding in terms of what is causing a lot of the healthcare disparities. I mentioned briefly lack of access, lack of uh, or deficiencies with respect to health literacy, which basically refers a, to a knowledge and awareness in terms of how to better take care of oneself. There are historical factors that contribute to the healthcare disparities, even from the patient perspective, a lot of times, a lot of these minority patients have developed a distrust towards physicians and the healthcare system based on some historical occurrences such as the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. There's obviously lack of access to health insurance, lack of access to quality healthcare, environmental nutritional factors. One of the um, most common terminologies now that we use is social determinants of health also contribute. There are genetic, hereditary, biologic factors, differential response to medication. I think the subspecialty in the healthcare system and lack of patients having primary providers or a consistent healthcare provider also contributes to the, uh, the healthcare disparities that we see. And a very important one that is really not talked a lot about is the fact that many minorities are reluctant to join or participate in clinical research trials, which are necessary to design and develop new medications that are going to be more efficacious, effective in these patient populations. And a lot of it relates back to the distrust that many of these minority populations have when it comes to researchers and investigators. This has been in the news. This is a real phenomenon. This, this health care uh, disparity crisis is a real phenomenon. And surprisingly, not all physicians and health care providers are up to date or, or even realize that this is a real phenomenon. This is just an article, it was actually 2002, that came out from the National Academy of Sciences that said minorities are more likely to receive lower quality health care regardless of income and insurance coverage. So there's a lot of data out there about the health care disparities. And what I want to do is real quickly is go into some of the solution that we've developed here at, at Cleveland Clinic to address health care disparities, especially in minority males. And the first thing as a healthcare provider or a healthcare institution that needs to be done is that you actually personally have to believe that you as an individual practitioner or institution can make a difference in terms of helping alleviate the burden or the impact of healthcare disparities on minority populations. And we do. We believe that we can do something at Cleveland Clinic. This is just a picture when we opened up our Minority Men's Health Center. Former Congressman Lewis Stokes, the late Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs-Jones, were at the center and who helped actually help us establish the center here at Cleveland Clinic. The other thing is physicians and healthcare providers need to become educated about the existence and impact that healthcare disparities have on minority populations. It may seem intuitive, but not every physician, as I indicated, is aware. There was a survey by the Kaiser Family Foundation several years ago, again back in 2002, a national survey of physicians which found that at the time about 70% of physicians underestimated or were not even aware of the impact of healthcare disparities on minority populations. And so what we need to do and what we've done at Cleveland Clinic is develop roundtable discussions. It's called the Congressman Lewis Stokes Health Equity Lecture Forum uh, that we hold periodically here at Cleveland Clinic to educate our own providers about the healthcare disparities that afflict these minority populations. It's very important that we educate physicians, nurses, mid-levels, uh, physical therapists, and others about the healthcare disparities because this is something everybody needs to become aware of. And I think this webinar today is uh, doing a great job of that uh, as well. We publish, we, we're a, a special guest editor in, a, in the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine. We have a, a healthcare disparity series basically designed to target primary care providers 
about how they can better address healthcare disparities and, and treat many of these minority patient populations. So it's good to get out and educate other healthcare providers. Some other examples of publications that we've developed. The other thing is we have to make sure that all healthcare providers are culturally competent and culturally sensitive because we know that culture has the ability to strongly influence the amount and type of communication between patients and their healthcare providers. So one thing that we do, we take our medical students, nursing students, some other students out to the community to interact with the community where they live in barbershops, beauty salons, churches, so they can start learning how to communicate with individuals from different racial ethnic backgrounds from themselves. The solution, if you're trying to engage patient, uh, minority populations, to be effective in disseminating your health literacy information and getting them to come in to undergo screenings, the first thing you have to do is focus on building trust because I talked about a lot of distrust that, that is actually out there in the community and one way to do that is to become part of the community. This is me at the Word Church, uh, which is a mega church here in Cleveland, which has about 25,000 members. And you also have to enlist their support. The community also is looking to see that there are other minority physicians that are visible and available to them. And again, it, it lends support in terms of that trust building that I mentioned. I can't stress that enough. I'm not suggesting that every African-American patient, for example, needs an African-American doctor. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I think these minority doctors can go a long way in terms of helping educate the community about health disparities, the importance of preventative health screenings, and to help them understand that it's important that they come into their medical institution to undergo the care that they, they need and deserve. The other thing is we're developing future health care providers. We have mentorship programs in Minority Men's Health Center. It's all about team building. We can't do this as one individual. Our health fair example, we screen several thousand men yearly. We have over 400 volunteers in all these different aspects and departments of the Cleveland Clinic that are involved. So it really takes teamwork. It takes volunteerism. And also we have a special facilitated patient access program at Cleveland Clinic. It's a charity assistance program. It's based on the, this probably needs to be updated, but it's based on the income and the size of the family according to what type of benefits we can get them to come in. We'll have to wait and see what the Affordable Health Care Act has in terms of getting more and more people in, into health care facilities to undergo uh, routine health, preventative health screenings. And again, we started our Minority Men's Health Center as a, a form of promoting access to health care. And we provide free preventative screenings because we know health screenings can help us identify diseases in early treatable stages. We've detected higher rates of prostate cancer in our patient populations that are coming in. And one thing that is important, we talk about the health care disparities, and, and I think it's important to note that since we've been doing a lot of the, the preventative health screenings from 99 to 2008, among white individuals and among black men, we've seen a reduction in colorectal cancer death rates, lung cancer, prostate cancer. So these preventative health screenings actually are doing good. They're of service, and we need to continue doing these things. This is a picture at our annual Minority Men's Health Fair about three years ago. It's important to note, in 2003, we started the health fair. We had 35 men show up. And you can see from this picture, there are several thousand men who have come in to undergo these preventative health screenings. Our health fair is the only source of health assessments for many men. And again, many men already have insurance, but they have, for whatever reason, not chosen to use it. This Minority Men's Health Center, the health fair, in a way, is a branding opportunity. Because of the name, a lot of these men who previously have shunned doctors and hospitals are more willing to come in because they see other men doing it. And I, this is something that other hospitals can stand up and take note and see what we're doing because we have to be very innovative and creative to reach these populations. We can't just sit in our offices and wait for these men to come in and see us. Early detection of disease I talked about. These are just some pictures of the health fair. We have collaborations from all these different departments. We lay our hands on the patients. We're in, in, in enhancing their patient experience. And again, it's all about trust building, making them comfortable, making them understand that we are here and, and ready and willing to serve them. This is a patient, I like this picture. He's given us a thumbs up for conducting the Minority Men's Health Fair. So we have a video. If you just Google Minority Men's Health Fair video, you can pull it up on Google.
it just gives you an idea of the magnitude of this health fair and, and how we're able to draw these minority men to come in for these preventative health screenings. The health fair takes place in the evening. It's in April, which is Minority Health Month. And we have a dedicated media and communications initiative to get out and, and get the word. We pass out flyers. We go to churches, go on, the, on TV and radio. And a lot of it is by word of mouth also. But it's very satisfying and gratifying to see that we're getting all these men to stand up and, and take charge of their own health. This year, the health fair this past year, out of all of the um, of screenings, we found about 8% of all the men that came in uh, had hepatitis C. And so now we have to follow up with those men and get them in for further evaluation. One important aspect also in, in terms of how you can start a center and, and engage these minority populations is to work through other community agencies and organizations such as the Urban League, the NAACP, the 100 Black Men, and we, we work with all of our local organizations. But we also have identified certain community leaders who can be our advocates because, again, it's all about credibility and trust. Oftentimes, individuals will listen more to their pastors, their spiritual advisors, more so than a medical professional. And so we need to enlist the support of these other organizations, the, the churches and other organizations, to help spread our message about the importance of preventative health. Some of these other slides, again, are just here for reference purposes. But what I wanted to do also is, is specifically talk a few minutes about this slide. I, I mentioned the terminology race-based medicine. And basically what that means is individuals from different races or ethnicities may respond differentially to different medications, for example. We know that in treating high blood pressure, African Americans tend to respond better to calcium channel blockers, and white Americans tend to respond better to ACE inhibitors. And so in the case of, even the case of renal transplantation, we know that African Americans, oftentimes we have to give them higher dosages of certain immunosuppressive, you know, anti-rejection medications because African Americans in many instances are more immunoreactive. Again, examples of race-based medicine, delivering medicine, personalized patient healthcare based on their race or ethnicity. This slide actually is an example of the pathogenesis or the, the etiology of heart failure in African American patients versus white patients. So over here we have hypertension, which causes left ventricular hypertrophy, which leads to heart failure. Hypertension is the leading cause of heart failure in African Americans whereas cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, leading from uh, causing myocardial infarction, heart attack, is a, a greater cause of congestive heart failure and heart failure in whites. So these are, this depicts a different etiology or cause of the heart failure. And so this is an example where physicians need to understand the pathogenesis of disease may differ according to the race of the individual. And that has implications in terms of differential treatments. And so this is a medication called Bidil. And if you add Bidil to standard therapies, and again, the AHEFT trial, this is in the literature, showed that there was an additional 43% reduction in mortality when using this medication Bidil. I don't have any disclaimers to report with this, you know, mentioning this Bidil. <clears throat> there are 43% reduction in mortality rate in African Americans versus Caucasian Americans there was essentially no difference in death rate in white Americans using this medication and a 43 percent re reduction in death rate in readmissions in African Americans. So this is a stark example when I mentioned that we need to get more African Americans involved in clinical research trials. This is a stark example as to why because there are medications out there that could be designed and developed that are going to be more effective and even life-saving if we can get more African Americans or minorities to agree to enroll in these clinical research trials so that we can note the differences. One of the problems that investigators have had for many years, even though the NIH requires inclusion of, of minorities and even women in many of these studies, we can't get enough African Americans and minorities to enroll. And so 
one thing that we have here ongoing in the Minority Men's Health Center, we go out into the community and we educate individuals about the importance of participation in clinical research trials. There are many benefits also that they can derive from their participation. In many instances, free medications, free office visits, and other incentives are given as well. We also, in terms of research, we established an African-American biobank. And anybody in your listening audience should be aware of this. We collect blood and urine. We store those specimens. And, and we want to allow investigators across the country, across the world, to have an opportunity to access these samples. Anybody who is willing to use these samples to do research into the causes, the pathogenesis of healthcare disparities, whether it be in diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, prostate cancer, you name it, can access these samples. That's why we're collecting these samples so we can study more in terms of what is causing a lot of these healthcare disparities. So anybody who wants to talk to me, they can email me, they can call my office and we can talk about how they can access their investigators the basic science researchers can access these samples to do healthcare disparities research i think one thing we need to do as a society and i'm i'm, I'm coming to a close is we need to identify many of the best practices that are out there i think i mean i consider our minority men's health center to be a best practice in terms of addressing health disparities in minority men i think hurley medical center is doing an outstanding job in terms of engaging the people up there in Flint, Michigan. These are examples of best practices. We need to get a compendium together of programs across the United States that are addressing healthcare disparities clinically and also research-oriented programs so that we can learn from one another moving forward. This is an example of an outcome study we did looking at results of kidney transplantation in African Americans versus Caucasian Americans. And we demonstrated, and again, this is a 10 year review of, of our results at Cleveland Clinic. We demonstrated that if you're an African American and if you receive a deceased donor kidney, your outcome, your, your short and long term outcome in, in terms of survival of that allograft, that kidney transplant, is not as good as if you were a Caucasian American. That p value is, is of significance. However, if you were able to receive a live donor, then your short and long-term outcomes were equivalent to those seen in Caucasian Americans. The results that we showed at Cleveland Clinic were in keeping with other results across essentially all the other transplant centers. But one of the take-home messages is that because of this study, it shows that we need to stress more to our African-American patients that they need to seek living-related or living-unrelated donors compared to relying upon deceased donors when and ever possible. You know, with that in mind, I, I want to just close here in a second, but I wanted to, again, stress the fact that we have to develop community partnerships. We can't really do this on our own. We have to also stress to the family that we need to become aware, African Americans, minorities need to become aware of our own family medical history when and ever possible so that we can educate ourselves, our descendants in terms of what diseases, medical conditions are more prone in our, to develop in our families so that they can be more educated and know what type of screenings they need to focus on as well. So, and also it requires that we partner with the health policymakers so that we can have policies put in place that are going to support preventative health screenings. And so with that in mind, I just wanted to thank you for giving me the opportunity to really highlight some of the work we're doing here at Cleveland Clinic and the Minority Men's Health Center. I'm, I'm available to go out and speak at any locations that anybody would want me to, to invite me out and, and speak. I'm, I'm more than ready and willing also to uh, help people start programs and just really, you know, get the word out there about the healthcare disparities and, and some solutions that are available to addressing them. So we'd like to thank you and turn it back over to you, Andy. Thank you for all. You've been absolutely wonderful. But let me sort of tell you what happened at Hurley. They saw men's health as an opportunity. These were non-users of health care, and they had unmet needs waiting for somebody. Dwayne, gentleman who worked for us there, really took it on as a mission, and they developed a series of monthly seminars and screenings with Hurley physicians, vascular health and stroke prevention, senior men's health checkups, mental health matters. I loved his pancakes and prostates. They were just out in the community on a monthly basis to begin to do, not just to talk about it. 
And these were terrific billboards. You think your car is more important than your health, think again. And, and they were really targeting men of all kinds. They had a wonderful man up when it comes to your health. This was an African-American men's health summit. And the 100 people who attended at a church venue, 78 screen, the cholesterol was high and the glucose was high and the triglycerides were high and their wives were bringing their men there. Then they had a marvelous men's health fest with over a thousand people attending. Mark Ingram, who's from Flint, was the keynote speaker and the attraction. But this was all an athletic event. This was a manly event. And then there was a tent for health care. And so this was a day of fun and fitness for men and their families. And it was really a wonderful community event, similar but different from what the Cleveland Clinic is doing. I share that with you because it doesn't quite matter the particular culture of your institution or that of the surrounding environment. You have to design something that's going to engage men in a much bigger way than simply you're not taking care of yourself. And this is not left brain stuff. This is all emotion. And then they started to work on the experience. Can you add value in an innovative way? Can we change the experience for men? Can we open later? Can we give them an opportunity to have no wait time so they don't have to sit there, often with people who make them uncomfortable, and not degrade their dignity by sitting them on a table in a gown with their wife sitting next to them? And this became a big focus. Can we teach young men and boys that visiting a doctor is manly? Can you change the whole attitude about men and health? And can you tie it into their sports teams and their peer groups so that places where they're comfortable become places that they want to go for the care that they might need? And I'm a big believer. I know some of you who are listening hear me say this often. It's fun and easy. Can we make it a game? People are really into play. And could a game help you make this something that was really a very different kind of experience? So I hope this webinar has helped you see, feel, and think in new ways before you have to do. And perhaps we can all help you make that journey. The joy of bringing Dr. Maudlin to participate with us is that he would like to share this with other organizations and other venues. And he is very much available to see how he can help. I'll put a pitch in for our next webinar. Uh, Sam Bostick is a physician down in Virginia, and he is going to be talking on June 6th about innovation and the work that he's done in terms of creating a new innovative things at Sentara Health. And I, I urge you to come and join us. For more conversation and uh, questions, Dr. Maudlin and I are both available. And we would like to thank you for coming today. And if there are any questions, we're open for them. You can tap them in. But at the moment, I don't, ah, how many years? I see one right here. Oh, this is a wonderful question. How many years has a health fair been held now, and what types of screenings do you uh, do? Yeah, we started the health fair back in 2003, and so we just had our 12th annual uh, health fair uh, this past April. And again, we always do it during Minority Health Month. And what was the other question? Or what type of we did about 35 different screenings. You know, one of the most popular screenings is for uh, prostate cancer, and we we do we do the PSA, we do the digital rectal examinations. I have about 40 urologists available. I have actually about 40 or 50 primary care providers available. And what they do, they check the pulse. They're looking for any arrhythmias. They listen to the heart and the lungs. We examine the abdomen, the extremity. We have vascular surgery available. We do lower extremity duplexes. We do carotid dopplers. We do head and neck exams for oral, oral cancer, dental exams. Vision screenings, we screen for glaucoma. We draw blood for cholesterol, HIV. Uh, hepatitis C, we do bone densitometry, uh, body mass index. We we actually collect urine to check it for blood or protein, which is a surrogate marker for kidney disease. Sickle cell screenings, we, we actually have about, almost every Cleveland Clinic department is represented and they have booths and tables. Uh, we do colorectal risk assessments. 18% higher incidence of risk factors for colorectal cancer in, in the patients that come to the health fair. Uh, we can't actually do the colonoscopies at the health fair, but we do the, the risk assessments, and then we get the, the higher risk individuals back in for colonoscopies uh, in, in the colorectal department. And so, yeah, each year we're trying to add a, additional screenings. We have screenings for stress and depression as well. So it's a very comprehensive screening, but it's just wonderful and satisfying to see the, the, the men responding and coming in. 
I had received another question earlier from my inquiries, and that question yep. was, more, what more can be done to push drug makers to make drugs that help minorities in particular? You made it sound as if the minorities don't like to participate in uh, trials. How can you reverse that and see it from the pharmaceutical perspective? Yeah, and I've actually had some discussions with pharmaceutical uh, representatives. You know, we're, we're talking about them investing, doing research and develop into, development into medications that are going to be used for a minority percentage of the population. And from their perspective, I mean, it may be difficult for them to see, you know, why they would want to do that. They're looking at in terms of revenue generation. And I know, you know, developing a, a new medication costs millions of dollars. But again, they, they need to look at the big picture, their responsibility to the community, the fact that minority and multicultural cultural populations are increasing in percentage. But also, I mean, I guess maybe one way to, to sell it to them is the fact that they could develop a niche for themselves and be, be first movers in a, in a certain medication, you know, that would be very beneficial for these these groups. But again, it's all about, you know, raising awareness to these pharmaceutical companies also about the healthcare disparities. And again, it seems intuitive to, you know, us and your listening audience that everybody should already know about it, but, you know, we can't assume that they do. And so it's our responsibility to get to these policymakers and, and, and researchers and, 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 and leaders in these pharmaceutical companies and to, to raise awareness that this is something that needs to be done. Dr. Modlin, that's terrific. I have uh, one other question that had come through, and that was about uh, oncology and men's health. Is this driven yes. by, from urologists, or how do you get oncologists involved? I know in Michigan, right. there was a foundation that had men's health runs. Anything that you can add? Sure. You know, like I said, at the Cleveland Clinic, we, we try to get every aspect of Cleveland Clinic involved. We actually have partnership with our, our colleagues over in the Tulsa Cancer Center. And so they actually help us throughout the year. And again, we do more than the health care. They help us throughout the year. They help us get out into the community. And a lot of it is based on education. We're in partnership in terms of going out and, and educating the community about, you know, the importance of screening for prostate cancer, colorectal cancer. And one of the newer screenings that is available, and again, a lot of physicians are not aware, is screening for lung cancer at, at, at those at highest risk for, for developing lung cancer. So, yeah, we, we do need to include the oncologist the internist, you know, other primary care providers. I mean, th this has to be a collaborative effort. And the other thing I mentioned, I think that this subspecialization of medicine has contributed to the healthcare disparities. And, and by that, I mean, you know, and I just use this as an example. If you're going in to see, for example, the podiatrist to, to address your feet, they need to also be aware of what your blood pressure is. And if they see there's a, a problem there, then they need to help facilitate a referral to see somebody who can actually address that. So we need to act as physicians and not as specialists. I always say you get that medical degree before you become a specialist. So we need to remember that we're all physicians and, and we need to think globally in terms of the overall patient and not just focus on our specific uh, specialty areas of interest. There were two or three questions that I will take with you offline and you certainly okay. can email me and we'll connect. We are in good shape, and I think we're about ready to wrap up. I can't thank you all. You've stayed with us for the whole time, and it's been a pleasure. Dr. Modlin, thank you so very much, and I'm going to turn us off now. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, thank you.